torture chambers, secret passageways, vats of acid, and deadly vaults. In 1895, Chicago police unearthed horrific evidence of torture and multiple murders at the sprawling castle of H.H. H. Holmes. Masquerading under the guise of caring doctor, kind husband, and prominent businessman, H.H. H. Holmes was a contemporary monster, designing his buildings solely for the disposal of human bodies. Torture doctor, monster of 63rd Street, H.H. H. Holmes was America's first serial killer. Just south of Chicago, the suburb of Inglewood was thriving with commerce. The train station itself had nine leading lines of railway and over 100 trains stopping there every day. No other suburb of Chicago had this luxury. Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, a pleasure to meet you. Arriving in Chicago, Holmes finds work immediately at the E.S. Holton Drugstore located at the southeast corner of 63rd and Wallace in Englewood. Several months later, Everett Holton dies of supposed natural causes. Then Claire Holton, his wife, disappears after selling the drugstore to Holmes. Owning the drugstore, Holmes had a steady flow of cash. He would often purchase and resell goods and properties under his numerous aliases. In addition to scamming creditors, Holmes obtained his funds from other phony inventions, such as a mineral water elixir, which in reality was obtained from the city's water supply. 1888, Holmes secures a lease on the vacant property across the street from the drugstore, the southwest corner of 63rd and Wallace. It is here that Holmes will make his horrific dreams come true. He will construct a building for which the entire world will remember him. Fantasies start very young. And so what he did then was he took a step furtherance of his fantasies to make it reality. And, and probably, if we had done a little bit of investigation back then, we would have seen things like his plans. But not just plans for a building, because we'd expect to see architectural plans, but plans for his torture rooms. For the suburb of Englewood, the building Holmes is erecting at 63rd and Wallace is a massive construction project. Day after day, passers-by stop to gaze at the spectacle of the many laborers working together to create a magnificent new edifice in their neighborhood. Englewood residents were so impressed with the massive building that they named it the Castle. From its outward appearance, it seemed rather normal. But like the duality of homes, the exterior and interior of the building were extremely different. Holmes himself was the architect of the building. He was the only one who knew its design. There was this constant turnover of workers on the building. He would hire a mason to put in a wall and then fire the guy, or hire somebody to put in part of a staircase and then fire him. And uh, there, there seemed to be several, several very sinister reasons behind that. One was he managed not to pay a lot of these people because he was always claiming that they were doing incompetent work. But the other, much more insidious reason was that no one except him really had a clear idea of what the structure of the interior of the house was. He had a huge bank vault installed in one of the rooms. And the way he did it was he put the vault in first while the building was under construction and then built the room around it. And he bought this thing on credit and then refused to pay for it. The bank company said they were going to repossess the vault. Holmes said, well, you know, come on in and do, but if you damage my building in any way, I'm going to sue you for everything you're worth. The bottom floor of the castle housed a pharmacy, jewelry store, barber shop, restaurant, and a blacksmith shop. Behind this innocent facade was a gothic house of horrors designed by the mind of a monster.
The third floor seemed innocent enough, containing rented rooms, legitimate offices, and Holmes' own bedroom. But it was the second floor that contained 35 rooms, many specifically designed as killing chambers. Disorienting unsuspecting victims, the labyrinthian construction contained numerous staircases and doorways that led nowhere. For a quick method of hiding a victim's body, a concealed greased chute and trapdoor led directly into the basement of the castle. held the most terrifying rooms, resembling a medieval torture dungeon. Acid vats, quick lime pits, and a crematorium disguised as a glass-bending furnace were Holmes's favorite methods of immediate body disposal. After cleaning and mounting their bones, Holmes would profit from his victims by selling their skeletons to local medical schools and universities. Holmes would make a killing in Chicago, financially and literally. May 1st, 1893, the world's Colombian exposition is open to the public in Chicago. Spanning 600 acres, sprawled out along beautiful Lake Michigan, the magnificent fair is a monumental sight to behold. Over 20 million people from around the world would attend the dazzling World's Fair between May 1st and October 30th, 1893. Holmes utilizes the World's Fair as the perfect opportunity to capitalize on his demented design of the castle. Located only a few miles from the World's Fair, Holmes' castle was perfect lodging for tourists. Holmes decides to rent rooms to visitors of the fair. He entirely renovates the upper floors of the castle, bringing in the most modern furnishings and luxuries, all purchased on credit which Holmes had no intention of repaying. In addition to placing newspaper ads for rooms to rent, 
Holmes visited the fair with several of Benjamin Peitzel's children, preying on elderly women who flaunted their wealth, making sure he invited them back to the castle for a warm night's stay in a soft bed. They're not calling their relatives, telling them where they're at. They just know that they're going to Chicago to see the Columbian Exposition. Perfect victims, because they're unknown in the city. Their relatives, wherever they came from, know that they were coming to Chicago, and they never came back. Now, how do you start to find them? They don't even know where they stayed. Perfect, easy victims. I'm sure some of them got in and out of his place with no problem. And others, they walked in and they never checked out. Some of the rooms had been completely lined with asbestos to make them soundproof. Hidden in Holmes's office was a master control panel which connected to gas lines leading into airtight sleeping chambers. Holmes would lead his victims into the rooms, lock them in, and turn on the gas asphyxiating them while watching their demise. Let me out! Holmes, let me out, please! Holmes! Holmes! Holmes, please! Holmes! At the height of the World's Fair, Holmes masterfully juggles his castle businesses, renting rooms, dodging creditors, selling skeletons, and attending to the needs of the many women in his life. I have had many young ladies in my employ, most of whom are still living in and about Chicago, whose parents and friends know only too well that far from being their seducer, I have done much to materially help them in their narrow lives. Being a personable, attractive young doctor and businessman, Holmes won the hearts of many women throughout his life. At one point, Holmes managed to secretly have three wives each never knowing of the others. In 1890, Julia Connor became Holmes's employee and mistress, living at the castle with her daughter, Pearl. When she became pregnant and demanded marriage, Holmes agreed on the condition that she allowed him to perform an abortion on her. She agreed. Neither Julia nor her daughter, Pearl, were ever seen again. Just a week later, Holmes sold a clean, articulated skeleton to the Hahnemann Medical College for nearly $200. In 1892, Holmes acquired another mistress, Emmeline Sigrand, and employed her as private secretary. Holmes sent Emmeline into the vault to retrieve some papers and sealed it, suffocating her to death. Several weeks later, the University of Chicago acquired a female skeleton from Dr. Holmes. In 1893, Minnie Williams became Holmes's new private secretary and eventually his mistress. Minnie was the beneficiary of a property in Fort Worth, Texas, valued at over $40,000. Holmes murdered Minnie and her younger sister, Nanny, after having Minnie sign over the Fort Worth property to him. In 1894, Georgiana Yoke became Holmes's third wife. He married her under the name Henry Mansfield Howard. Like his other legitimate wives, Georgiana lived out her entire life. On July 19, 1895, Chicago police enter the Holmes Castle. The world would now learn of the horrors that the castle had kept secret for so very long. As disoriented detectives and police search the upper floors of the castle, the true depths of Holmes's evil were waiting in the basement.
Among the death devices in the basement of the castle, investigators find piles of mixed human and animal bones, bloody women's undergarments, and a wooden dissection table saturated with dried blood. Chicago police were inundated with names of people reported missing from the World's Fair. Fifty missing people were eventually traced to the Castle of Horrors. The evidence, blood and bones found in the basement posed a problem for 19th century criminal investigative techniques. It was very difficult to go and identify even the bones as being human in origin because with the very small fragments you didn't have enough of the identifying characteristics to be able to make that ID. The world is now calling Holmes the monster of 63rd Street, torture doctor and the modern Bluebeard. Overnight, Holmes transforms from arch-swindler to arch-fiend. A Chicago journalist calls Holmes a multi-murderer. The Holmes case generated this incredible amount of na national attention, and really international attention. Really in his own time and in America, Holmes was much more notorious and more widely known than Jack the Ripper, who was a contemporary of his. Then as now, people were very, very fascinated to sort of visit the sites of these terrible crimes. And his castle became a kind of tourist site. And there were various people who were going to, wanted to take it over and turn it into a kind of murder museum. And then, just before some impresario was about to make it again into this tourist attraction, it just burnt, it burnt down. Somebody burnt it down. I mean, it could have been, who knows, some outraged citizen who didn't want this to become some very morbid tourist attraction. Holmes' trial was kind of the O.J. Simpson trial of the day. It just generated this huge amount of publicity. The case had become a kind of national obsession. Of course, there wasn't CNN or Court TV back then, so it couldn't be covered quite as relentlessly. But it was covered very, very extensively. There were true crime books and pamphlets and all kinds of stuff. And Holmes himself had become a sort of folk figure almost, you know, the sort of national boogeyman. courtroom fills for the final verdict to be read. Holmes becomes extremely nervous when not one of the jury members looks at him. In his entire criminal career, this is the moment Holmes never believed would occur. He is found guilty of murder in the first degree. Herman Webster Mudgett, alias H. H. Holmes, would be hanged on May 7th, 1896. was in jail awaiting the execution of the sentence, he was made an offer by William Randolph Hearst, uh, supposedly for a significant amount of money to provide his confessions. Holmes, who had already issued at a half a dozen completely self-contradictory versions of, of his crimes, clearly at this point felt he had nothing to lose. He was going to die anyway. 
In this confession, he did a complete about-face and portrayed himself as the worst monster who ever lived. He just basically confessed to every crime anybody had ever suspected him of and threw in a few more for good measure. He's reliving the fantasies after the fact now. He's reliving the fantasies of things that he did. She was very willing to do this and prepared to leave the vault upon completing the letter, only to learn that the door would never again be opened until she had ceased to suffer the tortures of a slow and lingering death. The partial excavation in the walls of this room found by the police was caused by Latimer's endeavoring to escape by tearing away the solid brick and mortar with his unaided fingers. I closed the door and turned on both the oil and steam to their full extent. In a short time, not even the bones of my victim remained. It was the footprint of Nanny Williams that was found upon the painted surface of the vault door, made during her violent struggles before death. Only one difficulty presented itself. It was necessary for me to kill him in such a manner that no struggle or movement of his body should occur. I overcame this difficulty by first binding him hand and foot, and having done this, I proceeded to burn him alive by saturating his clothing and his face with benzene and igniting it with a match. As soon as he had ceased to breathe, I cut his body into pieces, and by the combined use of gas and corn cobs, proceeded to burn it with as little feeling as though it had been some inanimate object. I immediately took them to the Vincent Street house, and compelled them to get within the large trunk, through the cover of which I had made a small opening, and ended their lives by connecting the gas with the trunk. Then came the opening of the trunk, and the viewing of their little blackened and distorted faces. Then the digging of their shallow graves in the basement of the house. The ruthless stripping off of their clothing, and the burial without a particle of covering save the cold earth. I am convinced that since my imprisonment, I have changed woefully and gruesomely from what I was formerly in feature and figure. My features are assuming a pronounced satanical cast. My head and face are gradually assuming an elongated shape. I believe fully that I am growing to resemble the devil. gallows just before he died he recanted he claimed that the confession that he had published was a complete fabrication the extent of my wrongdoing in the taking of human life consists in contriving the killing of two women that have died at my hands as a result of criminal operations that is all I have to say H.H. H. Holmes is hanged on Thursday, May 7, 1896, just nine days before his 35th birthday. At 10.25 a.m., he is pronounced dead. He was very concerned that after his execution, his body would be dug up either by medical men seeking to dissect his brain and find out what made him tick, or, or just ghoulish sort of you know, souvenir hunters, and he requested that he be buried within a big slab of concrete, which he actually was. One of the things about Holmes is that nobody knows for sure how many people he actually killed. 
Um, although in my researches, which were pretty, I feel, thorough and, and extensive, it, it seemed very clear to me that he murdered at least nine people. There have been stories that he killed 50, 100, countless people, particularly in Chicago at the height of the World's Fair. How many people did Holmes actually murder? Most likely, no one will ever know. Holmes and the many other people that came in contact with him are long gone, having taken the answers with them to their graves. I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world. And he has been with me since. Thank you.